Hello class and welcome to week three of history and systems of psychology. This lecture video will serve the purpose as to reviewing your week three activities as well as going over the project that is due at the end of the week. I hope you all had a great weekend. Um, it is week three. Uh, surprisingly, it doesn't feel like it, but um, here we are. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So for this week, you will have um, to read two, two chapters, of course, chapters five and six, as well as a little bit of supplemental reading, reading called Holy Anorexia in the DSM. Um, this is an interesting article for you guys to read. Uh, and I think that you will find, similar to what we've discussed before, the history of certain disorders and things like that are very intriguing and in how they come about and things like that. And so it's important for you guys to to read this and look over it and just form some port, some sort of um, thoughts on what other disorders may look like in the early centuries, um, things like that. Specifically, I know we talk a lot about uh, autism now, um, but when you look back into generations previous to, you know, our parents' generations, what was autism then? What did that look like? How was it different? Uh, different prevalence, um, things like that. So it's just interesting to think about uh, all the many disorders that are developing and have uh, previously been around and the difference of what they look like and how they are showcased nowadays. So you also have a video on American functionalism. Actually, two. it's two parts. Um, the first part will be an hour long, so you'll have that. Uh, so prepare yourself for that, as well as the second part will be 58 minutes. Um, so it's about a two hour long um, video, so just prepare yourself for that. Also, you will have a website review over William James. Um, he's also known as the father of American psychology. So this is just gives you another background into the history of psychology and who is the father slash um, one of the founding fathers of psychology in his in his life and his work. The discussion board this week will be over the article Holy Anorexia. Um, so this uh, this will be an interesting discussion board post because I want to get you guys' feedback and your thoughts. Um, so you'll discuss a religious basis for some of the historic cases reviewed. Um, and you're of course you're asked to read diagnose, diagnostic criteria in the DSM for anorexia. Um, and the most current edition of the Diagnostic Manual, of course. So I'm interested to see your thoughts and your feedback on this topic. Um, so yeah. And lastly, you have a project due. So this is the timeline of psychology. This would be a fun project as well. So this is where you organize a timeline of key figures and the developments in the history of psychology. Time I should start with uh, philosophical roots of psychology during the pre-Renaissance period. Um, so that's talking about Plato, Stoicism, Confuci Confucius, um, and things like that. Also, and it'll end with the establishment of psychology as a discrete science field. So once lab in Leipzig in Germany, uh, we talked about that in the previous lecture, how Le um, once uh, had his Leipzig um Leipzig uh, laboratory in Germany. Um, it was one of the first. Um, so in each slide, so it's going to be a PowerPoint presentation. I'll say that. So each slide should include a key figure for development or theory, a description of the person slash theory, and explanation of the influence of the person's theory. Additionally, at least one slide about discussing the figures and developments of theories and histories of psychology from a Christian perspective, identifying which are the most and least compatible with biblical teaching. The slide should also include some sort of visual aid, so graphics, pictures, photographs, just to enhance your PowerPoint presentation, um, to add a little oomph to your PowerPoint presentation. Um, the project will allow students to, to consolidate and further explore the information covered in the weekly course of by identifying and describing knowledge accumulated in early part of history of psychology. So here's additional guidelines for you guys. The presentation should be no less than nine slides long. 
So if you think about um, how each period, you'll have a slide for each period, and you'll have, of course, um, well, at least one side discerning the Christian's perspective. You should have include a slide for each key person or theory that you present. Um, your pictures and illustrations should be included. Um, these slides include good understanding of, of, of evolution of the psychology field. Of course, APA formatting so specific, so bleh, specifically for <laughs> APA formatting, your reference page um, is this is where um, you'll see the APA formatting. So you'll have your references similar to how you would write it in your paper, as well as your in-text citations. So for PowerPoint, it's kind of different, but similar to paper. So whenever you are, say you have um, a philosopher and uh, something that they developed or thought of so you can either put your in-text citation within the body of the text so it'll look like this so you have your say for instance it'll say plato discovered blah 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 um and this will be your information you'll have your just add your quote um your citation right here so it'll be um plato slash or comma uh 2017 the publication date if that makes sense um, as similar as you would do for your paper. Um, if you need further information on that, I can also provide that. I can upload um, a sample um, PowerPoint slide for you guys if you need that. Also, um, if you don't put the, the citation within the body of the text, you can put it at the bottom of the PowerPoint slide and that'll be a general overall um, of where you found that information. And I just mentioned this in-text citations. Uh, for all factual information. Um, this presentation is worth 100 points um, and it's one of the projects of course outlined in the syllabus. So I will also go into the rubric. Let's see. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, these rubrics are very um, good information for you guys because this gives you a background on what exactly I'm looking for. So of course the 20, 20 points will be for um oh no sorry not 20. <laughs> 60 points will be for the presentation and kids a very strong understanding of key figures and the evolution of the field of psychology beginning with the earliest philosophers and philosophies and ending with formal founding of the field um so presentation includes all required elements and they are well developed so this is the most significant part of your assignment so the development of your theories and your philosophies and your philosophers um, is a huge chunk of your paper or your project. Of course, APA formatting is up there as well. Um, so you have um, the organization. So if you have your titles laid out very well, your subheaders, things like that, it's very important for this paper in the flow. Um, and so it follows logical order and reflects a thorough understanding of the subject matter and there's no grammar or spelling errors and APA guidelines are um, consistent and then as well as creativity um, so the presentation has makes information interesting and entertaining with graphics symbols pictures and a background which enhance content um, so yeah this is exactly what this is exactly what I'm looking for and if you follow this you will be perfectly fine on your assignment uh, please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns about this assignment, and I can go over that. Um, and as I mentioned before, I can also um, provide you a sample of what I'm looking for if you are still um, a little confused on what exactly I'm looking for in terms of this assignment. So I'm going to go over briefly chapters 5 and 6. So let's get started with that. In chapter five, you'll be discussing psychology in the mass society at the beginning of the 20th century. So thinking back to specifically for your PowerPoint presentation, thinking back to everything that we've discussed thus far in the course um, will be great information to, to include in your PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let me see. I'm going to scroll, scroll through. Um, I don't want to spend too much time because you do have that two hour video to watch. You have an assignment. Um, and you have a uh, discussion board post, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, so let's 
scroll through and see what we can discuss. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I think this is a great chart because it it defines, you know, scientific disciplines, contributing psychology. Um, and it just gives you uh, a couple area of scientific disciplines, including phys physics and chemistry and biology, and how they relate to psychology and how it's beneficial to uh, the field of psychology. So it's very interesting for you guys to look over that. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so William James. William James is one of the important um, f f philosophers of psychology, um, and he developed the theory of functionalism. So, of course, it's connecting the individual and the social environment. Um, so, as I mentioned before, it's so commonly associated with William James. He was focusing on the dynamic purposes of psychological experience rather than on its structure. Mental states are interrelated and influenced by ever-changing behavior within a, a complex environment. So a little more information on William James. He was an American philosopher and psychologist. Um, and he's basically uh, the leader of and founder of like I mentioned, functionalism and pragmatism and things like that. Um, he, he, his belief in the connection between the mind and body led him to many developments within the field of psychology. So this is the father of American psychology. Um, this is one of the people that you can definitely add within your PowerPoint presentation because as I mentioned before, he's the father of American psychology, so he's very important. Moving forward. Um, so just here's a little um, diagram of his views of psychology um, and a little bit deeper development into um, his thoughts and his processes and his viewpoints and his methods. And of course, your text will spend uh, some substantial amount of time talking about him. Um, okay, why is this not working? <laughs> okay, I guess I have to um, scroll down. I'm trying to think there's anything else I want to talk to you guys about um, in this. I don't want to spend too much time on this like I mentioned before. Um, but you guys will read all this in your chapters. So let's jump right into chapter 6. Oh, okay, so chapter six is clinical research in psychology at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So this is an interesting chapter because this starts a discussion about what people know about mental illness. Uh, madness, hysteria, neurosis are all names um, can, that in the early century, 1900s and, and 20, early 20th century, that people were calling specific illnesses within mental health. Um, so these are the common terms that you heard, hysteria. Um, so that would be along the lines of psychosis, things like that. Uh, madness um, and neurosis. So these are very interesting terms that were coined um, back in the 19th century. Um, and the thing that they used to do I was watching, um, I like to watch a lot of, of course, Netflix, um, but a lot of the shows, specifically like uh, The Crown, um, if you haven't seen that, um, it, it's it's about, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth and her life and things like that, and it's kind of set in how it would look in modern day times, um, but the grandmother of the Duke of Edinburgh, um, she was a former patient of Sigmund Freud, and it talks about many of the things that she went through as a patient of his is she went through electric shock therapy um and just how back in those times how mental illness was treated and cared for it's just very astonishing um and once you're labeled um you know mentally ill or or you have hysteria or things like that or back when they called it it was 
you went through a lot of very gruesome things that they, they did back then. So I think it's important to look back at the history of things and see how far we've come thus far. And I know they still do um, uh, shock therapy, um, which is very interesting. And considering back then, they didn't have as many resources as we do now. So you can only imagine how painful or scary um, things used to be back then. Um, so popular beliefs about mental illness. So mental illness became a special explanatory category for those whose behavior was out of the ordinary and difficult to explain by understandable causes. So even now in today's terms, when people do certain things, it's kind of like, why do they do that? But imagine back then when they didn't have all these, they didn't have the DSM, they didn't have medical doctors that have seen uh, psychosis or bipolar or um, depression. Um, so it was quite interesting to see how the development of that and where we are today. Just imagine being back in the 19th century and having this, having depression, not knowing what it is um, and dealing with that. Um, another popular belief is having a mental illness often meant being an outcast. Um, but I think that's still prevalent today. Um, I know back then it was seen as, you know, uh, very weird, but even today, I think stigma behind mental health and mental illness is still there. And even across cultures and the pub, the public maintain an overall negative reception of mental illness. But I think that as modern times go, we are improving and increasing our, our openness um, for mental health and things like that. Uh, people had a broad expectation that some forms of mental illness were curable. Um, and that is common today. Of course, a lot of the illnesses are um, curable with medicine and things like that. Um, so that is a continued popular belief, so, and which is accurate. Um, let's see. I'm not sure I'm going to talk to you about anything else. Let me look. Let me scroll through and see what else I have for you. Um, so here is a chart. This is um, an interesting um, chart for you guys to include possible components within your PowerPoint presentation. So this gives you a list of um, links between brain um, and behavioral abnormalities. So some of these people could be influential people in your PowerPoint presentation that you want to include. Um, so the nervous system. Oh, this is um an interesting table as well. So the functions of mental asylums in the 19th century and the early 20th centuries. So there is many reasons why mental health asylums, as they call them back in the 19th century, or mental health facilities. Um, were created. Uh, so one of the reasons was incapacitation. Incapacitation. So the asylum served the function of incapacitation. So they were um, for people that were incapacitated, violent individuals, um, and they were considered to be a danger to themselves or others. So this would be in modern day terms, suicidal people, homicidal people, psychotic people with violent tendencies, things like that. Um, so they would provide relief from families and communities. Um, however, these asylums became a con convenient depository for unwanted in individuals who were no longer capable of exercising their rights. So sad, sad stuff. So if you think about it, people with schizophrenia, people with psychotic tendencies, uh, people with uh, suicidal thoughts or homicidal, um, ideation, things like that. This is also a place for isolation. They isolated these individuals who were deemed embarrassing, difficult, or unacceptable, thus creating a social, societal impression that the problem with the mentally, mentally ill had been somehow addressed. So they shut these people off. Um, so if one instance, say you're with your family and your brother or sister developed um, psychotic tendencies, they would shut them off from the family and just lock them away into this asylum. They were also there for research, and I talked about previous things 
um, um, mental health, uh, mental shock treatment, shock therapy. Um, they also did these for, you know, people in the LGBT community back then. Um, with any type of weird behavior, um, they would send um, people away and lock them up in these asylums. And if you look back on the history of mental health asylums, as I mentioned before, the history of these facilities were just not the best place to be, um, specifically for someone with who struggles with mental health. Like that definitely would have been um, a hard place to live. Um, research. So, like I said before, asylums provide the opportunity to gather empirical information about mental illnesses and to conduct experiments on the effectiveness of treatment methods. Um, um, however, it is said that the uh, the methods of data uh, collection were often unreliable in these asylums. And lastly, they were there for treatment. Um, so they offered a, a wide range of treatment procedures um, and they were typically limited to uh, work, exercise, or diet. Um, unfortunately, specialists did not agree on the major principles and the methods of treatment. So there was a lot of conflict between um, the people that were running the asylums and what methods were best practices for treatment. Um, so this is also interesting too. So in the 19th century, before um, we had medication, things like that, um, there was many methods of treatment that uh, physicians were relatively free to choose um, to try to prevent or fix someone who was deemed weird or had a mental health issue. Um, so the method of treatment um, and their studies of effectiveness. effectiveness. Um, one of them was cold baths, uh, <laughs> which is very interesting. So if someone is experiencing maybe depression, anxiety, or whatever it may be, they would put them in a ice cold bath, um, and they were uh, assuming that that would help fix the issue. They'd also give them laxatives, <laughs> so they would try to, I guess, rid out all the um, bad stuff by making them poop. And also, another interesting one was bloodletting. Um, so basically, this is the surgical removal of uh, a patient's blood for therapeutic purposes. So what they would do is they would hook the person up to a machine and let, you know, let them release blood. Um, uh, that's very, <laughs> to think about it now, it's like, I'm pretty sure some people could have died from that too, from a loss of blood, but they would use like leeches and um, all types of maybe in crude instruments, just considering, you know, this is one of the oldest practices. Bloodletting um, is just something that is not done today. Of course we do, you know, we give blood and things like that, but letting someone's blood out to relieve them from uh, mental illness is definitely crazy. Um, but also physical labor was involved in early attempts at treatment. So, um, this could be considered as exercise possibly. Um, but then that's when they started doing opium and morphine, um, and orderliness. So of course, um, having the person be more organized, but just thinking of these early, um, uh, attempts at treatment, how <laughs> crazy some of them are definitely, um, Moral therapy, also one as well. Um, so it was generally assumed that some form of mental illness was a result of serious misfortunes in a, in a pa patient's life. Um, and this is common to theme of today. So a lot of times when we have people with mental health issues or it started with a, uh, a I want to say, a significant event that occurs in someone's life and we've seen that in many times specifically with the discussion of active shooters and now nowadays um, a specific event led them to this occurrence um, whether it was bullying or whatever it may have been there's always a significant event and something interesting to think about specifically for schizophrenia schizophrenia is a developmental disorder so 
it occurs in within the ages of 20, 18 to 22 um, is typically the general onset of schizophrenia. And most circumstances that set the, um, so it's basically like a gene in your body. And mo most circumstances that set off um, this uh, reaction um, is life circumstances. So um, a child leaving for college, that's something new. A divorce between parents the loss of a job there's always something that sets this um, gene in motion um, and that's typical for many disorders depression um, that could be a loss of a job a loss of a family member um, divorce things like that set mental illness in motion so it's important to think about how they thought of you know moral therapy back in the day and how uh, serious misfortunes is the reason why mental illness occur and that I think that there's a lot of evidence to support that in modern day terms. So they believed that if the person returned to a normal mental state or a normal way of life, um, the patient should experience, um, uh, of course, compassion and trust, and they will gradually uh, learn to uh, heal themselves through learning and hope, um, and they can restore, uh, of course, the lost qualities of good behavior. So that was definitely interesting how that thought process was developed. Um, and also, Dorothea D Dix, uh, she was a huge human rights advocate. Um, she led the campaign to create civilized conditions of individuals living in mental asylums. So this is back when, as I mentioned before, the treatment for uh, mental health uh, people back in the day was horrible um, and Dorothea Dix stepped in and led this campaign to um, ensure that these people were getting the adequate care and a civilized care at that um, and for those that weren't getting that treatment so she would travel across all across the United States and she would ex inspect the facilities in which mental patients were kept um, and she would report uh, about the inhumane conditions uh, which that the uh, the afflicted person spent their lives abandoned by their family members um and it was a huge thing because then it, it it created um more better care for people that are struggling with mental, mental illness and and became part of um you know governmental rules now and nowadays so in part because of her advocacy the federal government in 1855 funded the Government Hospital for the Insane, um, now it's mainly located in Washington, D.C. This asylum was the first large mental facility of its kind in the United States. Because of her actions, this is what was created. So it's just it's some good stuff. So she would, would be a great person for your presentation as well. Um, Whitmer, he founded one of the world's first psychological clinics at the University of Phoenix, or I'm sorry, University of Pennsylvania, in 1896, at a time when psycho psycho psychology research labs were opening in several school schools across the United States. Um, but he was also um, he wanted to develop a new field of psychology dedicated to people in need. Um, so he was an advocate for that as well. Um, in 1896, Whitmer described the symptoms that are today labeled as autistic disorder. So as I mentioned before in previous, um, in a couple minutes prior to this, um, we, as we mentioned, you know, autism was, is a huge thing now, but back in the day, we didn't know what autism was, but we had the symptoms, we had um, similar occurrences, but we just didn't name it that. So it's just important to think about many of the, the, the etiology of, you know, certain disorders and where they come from and where they stem from. Um, so it's just interesting stuff. And I can, I bet you can probably tell how passionate I am about, um, early mental health issues and things like that. Um, but it's just, I think it's just interesting stuff learning about, um, previously how people were treated what they did to find out you know these disorders just interesting um all right so i think i've spent too much time already <laughs> all right this lecture video was only supposed to be 15 minutes long and guess what this it's 30 um but as i mentioned before i just wanted to make sure you got you guys had all the information that you needed for your week um and touch on a few really important and key topics um 
of history of psychology, how interesting it is. Um, and I know for some, it may not be as interesting as it is to me, um, but just so you guys have that information and just to think about, and if, even if you don't use it for psychology, think about how so many other things in the world are developed and brought about and think about the history of them. Because it's important to know those things because it's it made us to where we are today. Um, so I think that's all. I just want to wrap this up by saying uh, I look forward to look at your presentations. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to re reach out to me. I am here and readily available to assist. Um, have a great week, and I will talk to you soon.